if you're trying to manipulate someone based on what you know about them to get them to do what you want them to do, you're not helping them solve their problems, you're helping you solve yours. It's scary when you realize that this can be done at scale to even you know, destabilize democracies. We're not talking about purchasing t-shirts and, you know, and things like that. We're talking about democracies. We're talking about the foundation of our civilization, in a way. And it's happening. There is a broad agreement that the internet has been a boon to humanity. For companies large and small, digital marketing has unlocked new global opportunities, in part powered by the ability to understand behavior using data, using measurement to improve. But is this ability under threat? There's also this kind of undercurrent that's been using it for political gain. And as is coming out now, we have you know Brexit in the UK, we have Trump in, in the US, have other countries with other leaders, and we're now kind of thinking that, you know, it's, you've got such a high percentage of people cannot tell the difference between real news and fake news. And people who are uh, less digitally literate are more likely to be on Facebook sharing fake news. It's terrible. If we try to, for example, uh, filter out fake information from real information or fake news from real news, uh, we could use data to do that and algorithms, but the same technologies can be used to improve that falsification as well. So it's kind of a tag game. We're, we're trying to stay ahead of the curve, but I don't think we're ever going to, it's ever, we're always going to be a few steps behind the, the misuse of data. And um, that's definitely a big issue. And I'm not sure what the solution is. I'm not sure if, there's, if there is a solution because that's a symptom of having unbounded data and having a culture where data is appreciated as somehow scientific fact when, in, when indeed data is only as good as the person interpreting that data. That type of thing, it's, it's still our integrity where there's an interaction between the tasks of, of doing the analysis or the data collection and the researcher or the individual who's doing the analysis and they're, they're tightly coupled and you, you don't really separate them. You can't separate the uh, analysis from the analyst. If we're talking about like, like the elections or what's going on in a lot of Europe in the United States and, and a lot of the conflict, I think sort of technology is the vehicle maybe for it or the channel for it is a way of sort of scaling the problem, but I'm not sure if it's necessarily where the solution is going to originate from. I think probably the solution is going to have to be a political one, perhaps a regulatory one, or I'm not really sure it's a much larger question. Data has become a real foundation of politics in general. I hope that we see some trends where we'll be much more careful about the data and the facts that we present. They've learned the lessons from, from Brexit and from the Trump election. So they will see both the power and the danger of data. And I think for them, it's going to be an equal measure of not being tempted to pick up the sword themselves and trying to use it for, for their own purpose. So there's a lot of conflicting interest there. From a consumer perspective, I think the political interest will be positive for their side. I think from an industry perspective, it will make more strict guidelines that we have to operate within. As we talk about the GDPR obligations related to privacy, what's turning more and more obvious is that it's not only about privacy anymore, it's about competition. It's about market share. It's about how much data is influencing our societies today. We play a unique role in the present and the future of what the digital ecosystem can accomplish. Through our innate understanding of complexity, of nuance, we can play a crucial role as translators to drive a deeper understanding. We can contribute to developing a more trustworthy global ecosystem. Cambridge is kind of the f maybe the first realization from the general consumers that they were being manipulated at a large scale. But there are tons of Cambridge out there that are doing things that are very similar to that. It's just that we don't know about it. So there's no issue, right? That worries me. Political campaigning has been running on data for so long. I think that, I'm not sure if it's interesting or scary, maybe it's the same thing, but it's the big irony of, of today is that we have so much data, we have so much knowledge at our fingertips, and, and we have more and more people misusing that deliberately. Data is being kind of weaponized more and more often, that it's one data set can get tortured by different groups in society or different politicians and, and interpreted different ways. Even as, it's kind of a reminder to me that data is not 
We like to think that it's completely objective, but it's but it's not. Uh, we, we can see its use in politics or in society that it can be used and abused and, and misused. 2018 was full of stories of some of the worst or egregious uh, misuses of data. And I'm sure we'll have more in 2019, but I think it just accelerates and makes that even a stronger case for why all of this is happening now. Oh my word. I remember my first Super Week, how could I forget it, of course. I remember closing the final slide of my talk was recommending to the attendees to market and to measure responsibly. It goes beyond that now. It is a much bigger question we've seen with real consequences what the capability of data and marketing and remarketing and the power of the internet can be when individuals or groups of individuals with a certain agenda, when they're targeted with a particular message, be that true or not, then it has meaningful, lasting and sometimes potentially dire consequences. It is valuable to reflect on the paradox that while the governmental digital trackability remains intact, if not growing rapidly, the tech industry, especially the measurement sub-industry, is becoming a focus of new limitations. While the latter needs careful thought and consideration, we might also need a new digital societal contract for the next century one based on mutual transparency between governments and their citizens. The things that we could influence were also things that we could manipulate because of this power that we had available. And a lot of my time was spent just kind of reflecting on this balance between you know, our abilities and our responsibilities between those two sets. And this is, I think, something kind of you know, very apparent with GDPR as well. So it's an interesting time at the moment and it's interesting also to see how much of this interpretation is, is given to machine control. Because we might assume that having like a deliberate, fair system of data interpretation would remove these kind of personal biases, but history doesn't really agree with that. I don't think, I don't think we're there yet and any, any time data is displayed, any time data is introduced into the discourse, it's always debatable as to is that good data? Is that a good interpretation? And I think it's a good thing that we always debate about data. I think it's a very good thing. We have to question the data. We have to question the data sources. We have to be critical about where was this data gathered from. But I hope that it doesn't turn into a meta discussion where instead of talking about politics, we talk about the data and argue about it. We should be talking about the ideas behind that data, why that data was collected, what it represents. So it's an interesting time, as it always is when we have this interview. <laughs> Data now is much more mainstream. A lot of just people outside of our industry probably just either didn't give it much attention or didn't care or didn't think it was so important. Nowadays, people realize data is important. It's important to a business, it's important to politicians, it's of course important to analysts. Uh, but it's also now important to the, just the average person in the street who looks online and they realize not only is it important, but it's valuable. And it can be misused and mistreated. So I think we're moving now, I think, to a place where data is almost treated like it's money. It has a value and people don't just give it away easily. Um, they think about it a lot more and, and that's a good thing. We have a responsibility and we properly take that on board and say this is necessary to advise, to educate and to, to point out. If you want to embark on this technique, if a client wants to choose to do a similar kind of thing, then there are consequences. And we have a responsibility to advise. If we fail to do so, that's negligent. We can't afford to do that. So the fact that the people here at Super Week get this, I think, is encouraging. I think it's a tipping point. It feels like a tipping point in terms of our approach to data, recognizing the power of the data and how we need to use it, how we need to be ethical, and responsible in every aspect. Then there are these um, unidentified threats around, around AI and ML. We don't really know, or we do have a very good idea about how our biases are manifested, how the algorithms that we build, um, are they steering us in the right, right direction? We've had this discussion for years now with, with things that um, social media platforms have been doing, how, how they're steering discourse. So thinking about some kind of governance controls and. Um, and the security of, of what goes on online, and especially the more it's algorithmically driven, the more we have to think about these things. The data that these algorithms are being trained on, they reflect sort of the biases that are already in society. 
and those biases will get magnitude and magnified in the machine learning algorithms that are, are, are built off of them. And so you're starting to see, and I think you're going to see a lot more of this perhaps in the next year or two around ethical AI and a lot more research in how biases in society get mapped into the data then get mapped into these machine learning systems and now we're just going to be automating. We need to be cognizant of the fact that we'll potentially be automating biases that are already built in. And so I think that's going to be less sort of glamorous or less exciting to the industry, but I think that is one, one area of growth and research that you're going to see. A lot of what we do is becoming automated. So even though we may think like we are in control, we may not be, right? So. In a lot of cases, we are giving power to other systems, other machines, other people, and making it so easy for them to leverage that power where they may not even understand you know, what's possible with it. I think that's something dangerous because I don't think we've done like a great job at educating the next uh, you know, level of people that what's possible. Measurement and data play an active role in democratizing access as well as business accountability. In the privacy accuracy trade-off, an optimal balance has to be struck to avoid the dual undesirable outcomes of less efficiency and higher digital fences. As we peek into the near future, we have to pause and reflect on what societal equality will mean in the age of machine learning. Yes, multi-dimensional decision trees will crunch data beyond our wildest imagination. But as individuals, as an industry, we have to remain credible and engaged to interpret, to explain, and to influence. I don't think there's been a single company who hasn't mentioned AI in their strategies over last year. Tools have been built that, that produce um, ML engines very easily. Uh, Google's been doing a lot of interesting stuff on the cloud platform with that. So with your existing data, you can very easily start building uh, machine learning models, for example. So there's been a lot of buzz about what can we do with AI and what should we do and what shouldn't we do, the ethics discussion, all of this stuff. That's been symptomatic of 2018. Two big things happened. One, there was a real and serious conversation and action around privacy and what, what that means to our industry and our systems and our processes. And in parallel, I think machine learning and AI, where does that fit, what can be done with it, uh, was also kind of ramping up and more and more people are taking that seriously. And it's interesting because the way those two intersect uh, starts to raise some pretty challenging uh, questions for, for, for analysts and companies. There was sort of an internal debate about whether interpretability of machine learning was important or whether or not it just matters the accuracy of it. At first there was some pushback primarily from the deep learning community or members of deep learning because deep learning is such a complex model it's very difficult to inspect, it's very difficult to interpret exactly what's going to go on, what's happening, what data is or what features are important or when are they important for different use cases. And so there was a little bit of pushback because inherent, or I shouldn't say inherently, but it's very difficult to interpret those types of models, and so they were quite protective of it. But in parallel, probably maybe two years ago, really sort of starting, and I think maybe it's a, a reflection of GDPR, which has sort of forced the issue. There's a lot more discussion in the rise of sort of ethical AI, interpretable AI. The challenge is that the, the data and the interpretation and the, the complexity of the data it's getting harder and harder to make that simple and clear to our stakeholders. And so we run the risk of if we have more data, more complex data, we do more advanced things with it, we still have to communicate that to our stakeholders. And if they don't understand it, if it scares them, um, if they just are skeptical about it, then they will kind of stop using the data. There's the risk that we swing back to, I don't want to deal with the data, I don't trust it, I'm just going to go back to working with my, my gut. 
So in 2019, I expect to see a lot more in terms of machine learning and AI being built into the tools and platforms that we're already using. I think we've started to see a little bit of this over the last few years, but it's still been a little bit of a buzzword. I think 2019 is the year where it's gonna actually start to become a little bit more of a reality. I think we're going to be using a lot of things like BigQuery or data warehouses to apply our own models. Um, and I also think that the tools are gonna start to get a lot smarter. The platforms, uh, the Google Analytics, the Adobe Analytics, the IBMs, the you name, anybody who's, who's collecting and storing data are going to be rolling out more tools to try to make that easier and more accessible. But I also think more importantly, there are more analysts and more university grads and more data scientists who are going to be trying to kind of guide the way forward as to how to, how to work with that data you know, more responsibly. The application of uh, advanced data analysis um, is, is moving forward to be less out of reach. People are working on taking things like machine learning and applied statistics and putting them into packages and use cases where it's repeatable and usable. So oftentimes we would see sort of the application of some of these packages that people are building and then they would build a shiny app, an R shiny app around it, something that you could just connect your data and it would do the heavy lifting of the work to help sort of productize the analysis capabilities of what we're excited about in the industry with regards to machine learning. Well, you know, I think 2018 in a lot of ways, not just for our industry, but in, in general, politically, socio-politically, globally, was a very interesting year. There's a lot of change that has come, and I think the industry is, in a way, reacting to that. We've seen changes with, uh, with browsers, we've seen changes with the technology that's available for, for tools like Google Tag Manager and different uh, regional regulations and requirements and, and whatnot. Privacy is a hot topic over the last couple of years uh, and it's not only about GDPR but also about customers becoming more sensitive towards their data and they want um, to understand how it's going to be used. I mean, I thought about this, you know, after the Snowden scandal, 2012, 2013, uh, with GDPR and with the Cambridge Analytica scandals uh, last year, there's a real threat there that, that things can come crashing down in, in our industry because we rely on people sharing data. And if they stop doing that en masse, um, our industry is in trouble because we don't have a plan B of collecting data. People were being targeted and manipulated to affect their decisions on a daily basis on, on things that are their core values as, as citizens of a democracy or things like that. Of course, people will say, oh no, I'm just a marketer. You know, that, that's not my job. But we have to realize that the technique we use at our level are exactly the same that they are using at their a different level. Now, what annoys me, what, what frustrates me, what causes me pain is that this was actually pretty smart technology. This was a good technique, but it was exploited. And it was exploited for manipulation with lies. Right now, there's two levels of risk in, in this. More bad cases like Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and stuff where data has been abused, which would push for more legal limitations like GDPR, which is just basically now something we have to live with. But also, on the other hand, with the browsers that are now building in data blockage, so, so we're not being able to gather the data like we used to. So this is kind of two curves that we have to move within. If you're in the weeds of this process, you can, you can be a little bit overwhelmed um, with all of the, the changes that are, that are coming and the need to do things differently. Things like cookies uh, could go away based on a lot of these rules and regulations that we're seeing. And if that happens, as an industry, we're going to have to really learn how to redo what we've been doing for so long. We're, we're on a journey. GDPR is the town that we've just passed. We've seen GDPR, we stopped, we stretched our legs, we had a, we had a picnic, and now we're going to see where the road's going to take us next. And I think the opportunities and the, the next destinations for the industry will be within cloud and within machine learning. The limitation that we have now um, due to GDPR and also not only to do, due to GDPR but also to the things that people just imagined themselves because they're afraid to get fines, it limits 
companies in providing better services and better analytics of their customer base. We're going to see a lot of changes to how we collect and how we use and what, we're, what we do with data and also the conversation we have to have to get the data in the first place. So already we saw in 2018 Apple released their ITP 2.0 which stopped third party cookies. In 2019 it looks like Firefox is going to be next to start blocking third party scripts. I'm guessing Microsoft and Google won't be far behind. For a long time, a lot of technologies in the, the analytics and measurement space have sort of based themselves around these third-party cookies. Having this privacy issue at, that is being pushed to the browser level, that is something completely new that's going to be a really interesting challenge. So what we'll see is a lot of inventiveness when it comes to how we get the data and how we use the data, but we will also be much more accountable for the data we have and, and what we do with it. So I think Accountable practices is something that will be a theme for 19. What was interesting is with the Google Tag Manager team is that they talked a lot about putting into place types of architecture to um, allow greater security within the tags. But what it didn't take into account was the fact that browsers are beginning to just block the tag management system. So um, I think that as in the th one of the threats to the industry would be um, the data pipeline beginning to break and then the industry response will, must be something server-side or, or some sort of alternative. I thought I saw a sentiment here at Super Week this year that more and more people are looking back like at the very basics, looking back at data collection, looking back at building those robust pipelines. And I think we're understanding that no matter how lofty our goals are, we just need to take care of the housework first. And we need to invest money into getting better data quality. And I think the platforms that we use are, are trying to steer us towards that direction as well. Google uh, with Firebase, for example, is, is very much putting the power back into our hands as from, from data collection perspective. We need to customize, we need to focus on, on just getting the fundamentals right before we can even start to imagine all the things we could do with an algorithm, for example. So I think there will be an interim period where we'll begin to be, figure out, oh wow, we're actually not collecting as much data as we thought we would because of um, ad blockers or browsers just not uh, playing well with, with our data collection mechanisms. Definitely personal identification, legislation of, by the governments um, on the data that people are being captured. We don't know what's going to happen with cookies what the browsers are going to do, if we're going to have to you know, abandon the sort of current practices and move back to server side, maybe have less data, but maybe we've, we've been too spoilt by the amount of data that we've had now, and we'll have to sort of be more thoughtful about the data that we're capturing. Now that dream of trying to actually have that single integrated view of the customer is, is I think finally dead, like it's not possible anymore. Um, so hopefully what that does is it shifts us more from building those pipes or that connectivity and more around focusing on what's the right type of data to capture and what's the right application of that data. I think that's going to be an ongoing issue now on, to be honest. Um, privacy in Europe has always been important, but I think that will now spread. I think there are uh, the big CEOs of Facebook and Google have actually said that they think this is a good thing. Now they understand it better. They actually think things like GDPR are a good thing. So I expect to see Google, Facebook, you know, Apple and all the others actually changing how they collect data. You know, already Apple's banning Google and uh, Facebook from internal apps that sort of happened this week um, for data breach sort of violations. So yeah, I think there's going to be a lot more uh, government and private sort of retaliation about sharing data. And then from there, I don't think third party cookies are the end. So who knows what's going to happen with first party cookies and the consent that we have to do to actually track our users and get the data we're used to having. If you look at changes that have been uh, announced or instituted by, by various platforms, they talk about things like blocking sort of uh, fingerprinting technology, as an example, blocking things that, that I would say are sort of operating in the shadows. And that's a good thing. It's all connected and it's all kind of driving this data and privacy conversation for 
um, not just digital analytics, but how are any of the information about us being collected and used? And we all want more transparency and we want trust. And hopefully uh, at the top, at the political or, or geo, uh, geo level, we'll start to have the good actors kind of drive this conversation forward and hopefully make it easier to, to make this happen and, and have the right destination. Oh, I guess it's enough <laughs> of legislative changes uh, for us. Uh, for us, like uh, services who work at Russian market, it's even more difficult because we've got our own legislative like issues, like uh, Yaravaya law. And another way, from another perspective, there is GDPR, and there is no more like local internet. The internet is global, so we have to comply both sides, and it's really tricky. If it sounds tricky, it is a common global privacy framework with a clear regulatory structure is eminently sensible. Indeed, it might even be critical in being able to ward off all kinds of protective tendencies. If a global framework does not exist, we might end up with a balkanized reality that widens the digital inequality gap and sadly reduces incentives for the type of innovation that rises all boats. 2018, in a, in a lot of ways, was a year of um, sort of figuring out what the future is of the internet and uh, starting to uh, change technology to, to be more accommodating for that. So I, I'm looking forward to um, the evolutions of Google Cloud Platform, um, giving us even more components, scalable components. I'm looking at AWS as well, um, how they're going to kind of compete with that, looking at what Microsoft is doing with Azure. For me, personally, I'm, I'm most interested in the cloud. What's going on over there? What can we do with, you know, what can we, we can already do so many amazing things with BigQuery. What else can we do with that? What can we start thinking about in terms of data flows and in terms of modeling and so on? A lot more people asking about how to get onto the Google Cloud in general. So um, it seems like that is really kind of being accepted now and is part of the mainstream sort of standard, that kind of thing. So um, that's been really interesting for us. The one that I'm most interested in is, is more advanced personalization that's based on uh, analytics data, uh, not just for basic remarketing, but using machine learning and data science to come up with uh, more uh, complex, deeper audiences that you can then not just remarket to, but personalize the site, uh, make it more uh, relevant for them. People are beginning to take their uh, digital analytics data and apply machine learning to it to do things that were not being done three, four years ago. So uh, some of the, the approaches um, in terms of, let's say, propensity uh, modeling, people trying to figure out when there's a user on my site, are they likely to purchase or not, based upon just a, such a wide range of behaviors that you wouldn't necessarily come up with heuristically. And letting, letting the machine learning al algorithm find that, that's very new. So I see, in terms of the evolution of the industry, moving more in that direction to say, how can we apply um, advanced modeling to the types of data that we have, um, or collect data in a way that's going to be good for those models, which may be different, different way of collecting data. So when we talk about what are the basic things you need to do, we no longer talk just about GA or anything, we talk about data pipelines, we talk about building a data warehouse, we talk about that being the very basic thing you should do in all your companies. I want, personally, my ambition is that if I go to a client uh, or, a, or a company and my job is to only work with GA, I consider myself failed as a consultant. I don't think that's ambitious enough. I see that tools that people are using become more specific and more, um, I'd say, technical. So we see uh, that a lot of companies start using cloud solutions, data lakes, um, building their own infrastructures to make data more available for the decisions. And I think it's awesome because it gives you the flexibility uh, when um, you come to answering business questions. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's these ephemeral risks, like whenever we talk about technological advancement, we are talking about um, a significant need to invest resources to learn about that stuff and to do it responsibly. Um, 
there, and there are many aspects to that. There's the financial aspect. If, we, if, if somebody just started working with the cloud, for example, right now, they would build a pipeline that is very expensive. They wouldn't know how to optimize it. They would need engineering skills to do that. So I think when we're talking about getting the um, um, technological advancements, we also need to figure out a way how to increase our learning capacity as, capacity as the cloud itself improves or the components themselves improve. Because all the data is sort of going in the cloud now, then people might start look at um, other bits of their IT stack that they might put on the cloud as well, on the digital marketing stack. So um, there's definitely going to be sort of examination of the data collection parts, whether they could stream that themselves or whether they use the products that are out there. So they're going to have to evolve and sort of cope with that themselves. Education is like everything. We need to learn to use those tools responsibly and, and think about the repercussions we have on our brands, for example, if we are um, you know, caught doing some, some, some weird stuff with data, we have to figure out how to control that, um, that whiplash. If we don't have people that are trained to think scientifically, to uh, think, I mean, I mean ethically too, but um, just to be able to be good thinkers and come up with a good hypothesis and, and, and think outside the box, uh, you know, that's what's going to be the limitation because a lot of times you might, you know, the, for CRO you optimize to the mountain you're on, but sometimes you need to make that big jump to another mountain which you can go even further. So if you just focus on where you're at and use machine learning to optimize within that, um, you're going to be limited. So I think all these tools are great, but if you don't have good people that are trained to think well, uh, that's going to be the threat because it's going to make people think, I'm doing machine learning, I'm doing data science, I'm getting a good result, and the reality is, is they're limiting themselves. So there's a new level of intelligence being put to the data that we're actually gathering. So if I look back to before uh, 16, 17, and it's, uh, then it was much about gathering data just for gathering data. But now there's another level of seriousness coming into it, that the data that we're gathering is actually being made operational and able to, to do something with. And that actually gives two new, complete different sets of challenges, right? One of them is data quality has to be in order because we're now we're using the data for something. So if it's not in order, then it's a problem. And the other thing, it starts opening up for new questions in relation to ethics. Are we supposed to be doing this? Are we supposed to be using data in this way? And this is a completely new thing because data hasn't been available in that sense before and hasn't had that consequence or impact. There's a little bit of art and science in web analytics or mobile analytics online basically because you're, you're dealing with so many unknowns and you're trying to make uh, or trying to understand known quantities by stitching together some unknowns. Business analytics really focuses on customers and, and customers are, are real people with real addresses and real bank account numbers and so there's a lot of certainty in that data and when you have certainty in your data you can do some smart statistics and smart predictions um, and that's a good thing. Web analytics is a bit of an outlier because the vast majority of data is anonymous. Um, the average conversion rate is something like 3 to 5 percent pretty much anywhere in the world and, and any ver vertical struggles to go beyond that kind of range. And so what you're dealing with is 95% of anonymous traffic. If today, if we talk about fundamentals, we talk about things like getting GA in correctly, getting data collection right, doing A-B testing, doing the kind of very basic stuff you, you can do with data. I'm kind of hoping that this year, the fundamental level just gets a bit more ambitious. 2019 hopefully will be a, a steady growth in technological ambition and um, at the same time, trying to trying to put up, slow down the crazy strategy leaps that people are having, and, and trying to slow down the kind of solutionism where we, we look at AI and we look at ML, we look at IoT, VR, whatever, and we're just looking at, oh, I want to do those. Those look really cool, but then I forget what the actual business problem was. So I want I want us to focus on business problems and and just you know building things and, and getting the fundamentals right. We'll see what happens with the, the larger macro economy and if there's some sort of contraction. I know certainly a lot of the marketing budgets will start to be contracted and so, you know, we'll see. I think we're okay for the next year or so, but then after that maybe we'll, you know, there may be some, some pulling back. The regulatory changes underway can contribute to breaking the global connections as well as creating a new digital cold war 
resulting in the division of this global network for political reasons. This will lead to a disappointing separation among people, nations, businesses, increasing the digital maturity gap between them. We as a people, indeed society, need to work together to avoid this outcome. From our governments, we collectively need to insist on a serious level of transparency. We cannot prevent them from collecting data, but the transparency will be our insurance. For businesses, we need to work toward a balance where data is collected under a common framework for clearly identified uses. There is a win-win-win out of this. Each one of us has an obligation to work toward that positive outcome for all of humanity. Can I tell my joke again that I opened with? Super Week's such a great conference. I've been learning so much. It's the stuff that you learn that's really important. So I was learning about cognitive bias. Cognitive bias, it turns out that that means exactly what I thought it meant. Pause for joke. Well, you'll always put it on the cutting room floor, but we always like to mention how Super Week is and how is and what a group of people to, uh, to speak with. I can't stay away. Like, Super Week has become the... It's that first week of the year that we can take a breather after Christmas and take a breather after a very hard work year done and come and get some perspective. And it really feels like it's become this, that, that's what it's like for everybody. It's so relaxed. As soon as I get onto the mountaintop, I feel insanely relaxed and everybody seems to stay the same way throughout the whole week. I mean, Super Week, just the, like the analytics community and analysts in general are just such people when it comes to sort of sh with uh, each other, knowledge, and, and, and Super Week, it's so much better than the last conference I was at. There were two talks about Venn diagrams. Boy, you wouldn't believe how much overlap there was. The way things are arranged gives space for, for the, the participants here. Right? There's quite a long time after dinner, between dinner and when people are going to sleep, that people are spending five, six hours with each other talking. After ingesting and listening to presentations, really having a chance to, to interact around them and, and other things are happening in, in, in the industry and in, in business. Together with that is how diverse the crowd is from a um, geographic perspective. There's people here from 30 something countries. That's an amazing amount of perspective that's going to differ from people from Central and Eastern Europe versus Western Europe versus the United States and, and Australia, 30 countries. The fact that we have that type of geographic diversity together with people who are really invested in being here because they want to speak with each other, I think that's where the real magic of Super Week lies. <sighs> Good Lord, I thought the presentation was nerve-wracking.